It was an ordinary day for Jamal West. The sun hung low in the late afternoon sky as he exited his law office in the heart of the city. A prominent civil rights attorney, Jamal had spent the day working tirelessly on several high-profile cases. He wore his usual sharp suit, a dark navy that complemented his tall frame and confident stride. As he walked toward his car, parked a few blocks away, he reflected on the cases that consumed his attention. People fighting for their rights, just as he had done for most of his career. The city bustled with life as he strolled through the familiar streets, but Jamal's mind was elsewhere. Despite his prominence, he was a man of the people, someone who cared deeply about justice for all. That's why, when he noticed a police car slowly trailing behind him, he didn't think much of it at first. He had no reason to worry, he wasn't doing anything wrong. Still, a subtle tension began to coil in his stomach, a feeling he had learned not to ignore. As Jamal neared his car, he noticed the police vehicle stopping a few yards behind him. His heart rate quickened, but he reminded himself to stay calm. He'd been in these situations before. He knew the drill. All too often, black men were subjected to unwarranted police scrutiny, and Jamal was well aware of the implicit biases that many officers held. His years of legal expertise had taught him the importance of remaining composed, especially when the odds seemed stacked against him. He reached for his car keys, but before he could unlock the door, two officers stepped out of the patrol car. They approached him with purpose, their faces stern and unreadable. Jamal knew what was coming. Despite the simmering anger he felt, he forced himself to stay calm. He raised his hands slightly, palms facing out, a universal gesture of compliance. Is there a problem, officers? He asked, his voice steady but edged with tension. The officers, a pair of men in their mid-thirties with hardened expressions, didn't answer right away. They exchanged a look that Jamal recognized all too well, an unspoken agreement between them, one that confirmed their suspicions about him without even needing a word. Jamal could feel the weight of their judgment before they even spoke. He was used to being stereotyped, but this encounter felt different. There was something in their demeanor, something hostile. You mind telling us what you're doing around here? One of the officers finally asked, his tone dripping with accusation. Jamal glanced around, bewildered. He was in the middle of a busy city street, near his office, in an area where he walked almost every day. I work nearby, Jamal replied, keeping his voice calm and collected. Is there a reason you're stopping me? His question seemed to inflame them further. Why don't you show us some ID? The second officer demanded. Jamal hesitated for a moment, his legal instincts kicking in. He knew his rights. He wasn't required to show ID without cause. But this wasn't just about the law. It was about surviving this encounter unscathed. He slowly reached into his pocket, pulling out his wallet. As he handed over his identification, he could see the officer's eyes narrow, their suspicion growing rather than easing. They examined his ID, glancing back and forth between the card and Jamal's face, as if searching for a reason to escalate the situation. You fit the description of someone we're looking for, the first officer said though the vagueness of the statement made it clear to Jamal that it was just an excuse. He had heard this line before. This is just a misunderstanding, Jamal thought, trying to reassure himself. But the situation was about to take a dangerous turn. Despite having his identification in their hands, the officers continued to press Jamal with questions. They were looking for something, anything, to justify their actions. What are you doing out here dressed like that? One officer asked his tone more accusatory than before. It was clear they didn't believe him. Jamal had seen this before. Police trying to provoke someone into reacting, to give them a reason to escalate. He kept his face neutral, refusing to give them what they wanted. I'm a lawyer, Jamal explained. My office is just a few blocks away. He gestured toward the direction of the building, but the officers didn't even glance. They weren't interested in the truth. To them, he was guilty of something even if they couldn't yet figure out what. The first officer smirked, his hand resting casually on his holstered gun. A lawyer, huh? And I'm supposed to believe that? The words were laced with condescension, a blatant refusal to acknowledge Jamal's position. Jamal's pulse quickened, but he kept his voice calm. If you'd like, you can call my office and verify. I've done nothing wrong. I'm just trying to get home. But the officers weren't hearing it. 
They exchanged another glance, this time more pointed, as if they had already decided the next step. Jamal could feel the shift in the air. He wasn't being treated as an equal citizen. They had already made him the enemy. Then without warning, one of the officers stepped closer. Turn around and put your hands behind your back, he ordered, his voice cold. Jamal blinked, taken aback. Excuse me, he asked, incredulous. He hadn't done anything, but the officers didn't care about that. I said, turn around, the second officer barked. The situation was rapidly spiraling out of control, and Jamal's calm exterior began to crack. His thoughts raced as he tried to make sense of what was happening. Jamal stood frozen for a moment, his mind racing as the reality of the situation set in. This wasn't just a routine stop. It was turning into something far more serious. His heart pounded in his chest, but he forced himself to stay composed. I haven't done anything wrong, he said, his voice still calm, though his eyes were locked on the officers. He knew that any sign of resistance, verbal or physical, could escalate the situation further. The officer's patience was wearing thin. I won't say it again, he growled, stepping closer and placing a hand on Jamal's arm. Turn around and put your hands behind your back. Jamal felt a surge of anger, but he bit it back. Years of dealing with these types of encounters had taught him that the law wasn't always on his side, even when he was in the right. He slowly turned around, reluctantly placing his hands behind his back. The cold metal of the handcuffs bit into his wrists, and Jamal's breath hitched. He could feel the eyes of passers-by on him, the weight of their judgment adding to the humiliation. He was a man of dignity, someone who had spent his life fighting for the rights of others, and now he found himself on the receiving end of the very injustice he had spent years combating. The irony was not lost on him, but it didn't make the sting of the moment any easier to bear. As the officers roughly pushed him toward their patrol car, Jamal kept his eyes forward, refusing to look at the gathering crowd. He could hear whispers, see phones being raised to capture the moment, but he refused to let the humiliation show on his face. Inside, however, he was boiling with frustration. This wasn't just about him. This was about every black man who had been wrongfully targeted, every unjust arrest that had gone unpunished. And yet, here he was, caught in the same web of prejudice that he had spent his career fighting against. Jamal tried to keep his composure as he was forced into the back of the police car. The door slammed shut, and through the glass he could see the two officers talking outside, their voices muffled by the thick barrier. Jamal's heart raced as he considered his options. He knew the law better than anyone, knew his rights, but in that moment, none of it seemed to matter. To them, he was just another suspect, another black man to be controlled and subdued. He shifted uncomfortably in the back seat, his wrists bound tightly by the cold metal handcuffs. The indignity of it gnawed at him. It wasn't just the arrest, it was the way they had treated him from the beginning. The suspicion, the contempt in their voices. They didn't see him as a professional, a lawyer who had spent his life fighting for justice. To them, he was just another problem to be dealt with. It was dehumanizing in a way that was hard to explain but it was a feeling Jamal knew all too well. Through the window, he could see a small crowd had begun to gather on the sidewalk. People were watching, some whispering among themselves, others recording the scene on their phones. Jamal wanted to shout out, to tell them who he was, to explain that this was all a mistake. But he knew better than to lose control. He had to stay calm, stay composed. Any sign of anger, any hint of resistance, would only make things worse. He had seen it happen too many times before. Inside the car, the silence was suffocating. Jamal's mind raced, replaying the events over and over. What could he have done differently? Was there anything that would have made the officers treat him like a human being instead of a criminal? As he sat there, surrounded by the weight of the situation, Jamal felt a deep sense of injustice settle into his bones. This wasn't just about him. This was about something much bigger something systemic, and for the first time in a long time, he felt powerless to change it. The police officers finally got back into the car, the driver glancing at Jamal through the rearview mirror with an unreadable expression. We'll take him down to the station, let the sergeant sort this out, the officer in the passenger seat muttered. Jamal felt a wave of frustration wash over him. 
They were treating this like it was routine, like they hadn't just wrongfully arrested him without cause. They didn't even seem to care if there was a reason for the arrest. To them, he was guilty by default. As the car pulled away from the curb, Jamal stared out the window, watching the city pass by in a blur. He had represented countless clients who had been in situations like this, people who had been stopped, searched, or arrested without cause. But this time it was happening to him. The irony wasn't lost on him. He had spent his career fighting against these kinds of injustices, but now, here he was, caught in the same system he had tried so hard to change. The drive to the station felt like an eternity. Jamal's thoughts raced, flipping between anger and disbelief. He wanted to shout, to demand an explanation, but he knew it wouldn't do any good. The officers had made up their minds the moment they laid eyes on him. It didn't matter who he was or what he had accomplished in his life. To them, he was just another black man to be controlled, another body to fill a cell. It was a stark reminder of how deeply embedded racism was in the system. When they finally arrived at the station, the officers pulled Jamal out of the car, their grips firm on his arms. What are the charges? Jamal asked, his voice calm but laced with frustration. One of the officers shrugged, as if the question didn't matter. We'll figure that out inside, he replied dismissively. Jamal bit back his anger, knowing that this was far from over. As they walked him into the station, the humiliation settled deep within him, but so did his resolve. He would not let this injustice stand. Inside the station, the fluorescent lights were harsh, casting a sterile glow over the cold gray walls. Jamal's wrists ached from the tight handcuffs, but the physical discomfort was nothing compared to the humiliation he felt. He was a respected lawyer, a man who had built a career on defending the rights of others. And now, here he was, treated like a common criminal, paraded through the station with handcuffs biting into his skin. As they walked him through the precinct, he could feel the eyes of other officers and detainees on him. Some watched with mild interest, others barely paid attention, but the weight of their stares was palpable. Jamal kept his chin up, refusing to let the humiliation show. He would not give them the satisfaction of seeing him break. He knew that maintaining his composure was the only power he had left in this situation. The officers led him to a holding area where they removed the handcuffs and instructed him to sit on a cold metal bench. Jamal rubbed his sore wrists, the sting of the cuffs still fresh in his skin. He glanced around the room. There were a few other men in the holding area, some of them glancing at him with curiosity. Jamal could feel their silent questions, but he remained quiet. He wasn't here to explain himself to anyone. All he could think about was how to get out of this situation. As he sat there, his mind turned to his family his colleagues, and the work he had left unfinished that day. How would they react when they found out what had happened? He imagined the headlines. Prominent civil rights attorney arrested. The thought made his stomach churn. He knew this incident would have far-reaching consequences, not just for him, but for everyone who had ever looked up to him as a beacon of justice. And that made the humiliation even harder to bear. While Jamal sat in the holding area outside, the scene was escalating. Unbeknownst to him, several people who had witnessed his arrest had taken to social media, posting videos of the event. Within hours, the footage had gone viral, sparking outrage among those who recognized him. The headlines were already circulating online. But they weren't just about a man being wrongfully arrested. They were about Jamal West, the civil rights attorney, being treated like a criminal. The public's reaction was swift and fierce. Social media platforms lit up with posts demanding answers, with hashtags calling for justice and accountability. People were shocked that a man like Jamal, someone who had spent his life fighting for others, could be subjected to the same injustice he had dedicated his career to eradicating. The irony was too bitter for many to swallow, and soon the story was picked up by local news outlets who sent reporters to the station. By the time Jamal realized what was happening, the media storm had already begun. As he sat quietly on the cold bench, the police station had become a circus outside, with reporters and cameramen lining up to capture the moment he was released. The officers inside the station had no idea who they had just arrested, but they were about to find out. Jamal's true identity, once revealed,
would send shockwaves through the entire department. The officers who had arrested him remained oblivious to the growing spectacle outside. They continued their paperwork as if this was just another routine arrest. But Jamal knew better. He could feel the tide shifting, and he knew that once the truth came out, there would be consequences. The public wasn't going to let this go quietly, and neither was he. This was more than a wrongful arrest. It was a moment that would expose the deep-rooted prejudices that still existed within the system. Jamal sat on the cold metal bench, his body tense but outwardly calm. He had learned long ago how to master his emotions, to keep the rage and frustration beneath the surface, buried deep where it wouldn't be used against him. But as he sat there, surrounded by the drab gray walls of the holding area, the weight of the situation pressed down on him. He had always known, intellectually, that no black man was immune to this kind of treatment, but experiencing it firsthand left a bitter taste. The silence in the room was deafening, broken only by the occasional shuffle of feet or the distant murmur of officers talking in another room. The other men in the holding cell glanced at Jamal from time to time, curiosity etched on their faces. They didn't know who he was, didn't know that the man sitting among them had argued cases in front of judges, had defended the rights of countless others. To them, he was just another man brought in by the police, no different from anyone else. Inside, Jamal's emotions were a storm, swirling with anger, frustration, and a profound sense of betrayal. He had always believed in the system, despite its flaws. He had dedicated his life to making it better, to fighting for justice within its boundaries. But now, sitting in a cell, wrongfully accused, he felt the full weight of its failure pressing down on him. He wasn't just another man being mistreated. He was a symbol of everything that was wrong with the system. But Jamal remained silent. He knew that there would be a time to speak, to tell his story, but now wasn't that time. Now, he needed to remain calm, to wait for the moment when he could use this injustice to create change. His mind began to clear, his thoughts shifting from anger to strategy. He wouldn't let this moment break him. He would turn it into something that would force the system to confront its own flaws, once and for all. What the officers didn't know, and what would soon become clear, was that Jamal West was no ordinary man. He was a force, a symbol of justice and progress within the legal world. With years of experience as a civil rights attorney, Jamal had built a reputation as a tireless advocate for equality. He had argued in courtrooms across the country, challenging systemic racism and fighting for those who had been wrongfully accused or mistreated. His presence in the cell was a testament to how deeply racism and prejudice were ingrained in the system. To the officers who had arrested him, he was just another black man in a suit. They didn't recognize his face, didn't know his name, and had no idea that they had just made a grave mistake. But Jamal's power wasn't in his fame, it was in his knowledge. He understood the system better than they did, knew the laws they were meant to uphold better than anyone in that precinct. Even as he sat in handcuffs, Jamal held the upper hand, though the officers didn't realize it yet. His silence wasn't submission, it was strategy. He knew that once his identity was revealed, the situation would unravel quickly. The police had acted without cause, and soon they would be held accountable for their actions. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Jamal's quiet dignity in the face of injustice was his most powerful weapon. He didn't need to shout or resist to make his point. He would let the truth speak for itself, and when it did, the system that had failed him would be forced to confront its own corruption. He wasn't just a victim. He was a symbol of the very fight he had been waging his entire career. It wasn't long before the precinct began to buzz with activity. The officers who had arrested Jamal continued to file their reports still oblivious to the storm that was brewing outside. But slowly, word began to spread. A young officer, fresh out of the academy, happened to glance at one of the reports. The name Jamal West caught his eye. He frowned, staring at the name for a moment longer. It seemed familiar, but he couldn't place it. Curious, the young officer did a quick search on his phone, typing in the name with a sense of unease. The results popped up immediately. Jamal West, civil rights attorney, had been making headlines for years. The young officer's eyes widened as he scrolled through the articles, 
Reading about the high-profile cases Jamal had worked on, the victories he had won for marginalized communities, he stared at the phone, his heart racing. This was no ordinary arrest. They had detained one of the most prominent civil rights attorneys in the country. The officer quickly made his way to his superior, the sergeant who had been overseeing the station that night. Sir, I think you should take a look at this, the young officer said, handing over the phone. The sergeant's face darkened as he read through the articles, realization dawning on him. You've got to be kidding me, he muttered under his breath. This is the guy they brought in? Within minutes, the sergeant was calling the officers who had arrested Jamal into his office. The tension in the room was palpable as he showed them the information. The officers, who had been so confident in their actions, suddenly looked nervous. They exchanged uneasy glances, realizing the gravity of what they had done. They hadn't just arrested anyone. They had arrested Jamal West, a man who had the power to turn their careers upside down. As the reality of Jamal's identity set in, the officers' attitudes shifted drastically. What had started as a routine stop and arrest had turned into a potential disaster for the precinct. The sergeant, now fully aware of the situation, demanded answers. How did this happen? He barked at the officers who had made the arrest. They fumbled for excuses, their earlier bravado replaced by fear and uncertainty. We, we thought he matched the description of a suspect, one officer stammered. Though even as he said the words, it was clear that the excuse was weak. The sergeant wasn't buying it. He knew that their actions had been driven by nothing more than racial profiling, and now they were in serious trouble. The weight of the situation was starting to settle on their shoulders, and the room was thick with tension. Meanwhile, Jamal sat in the holding area, unaware of the chaos that was unfolding in the station. He had sensed a change in the officer's behavior, but he didn't yet know the full extent of what was happening. He remained calm, his mind working through the legal avenues he could pursue once he was released. He knew that this incident would not go unpunished, and he was already preparing to take action. Back in the sergeant's office, the officers were scrambling to figure out their next move. We need to fix this, one of them muttered, his face pale with fear. The sergeant nodded grimly. You think? We just arrested one of the most well-known civil rights attorneys in the country for no reason. This is going to blow up in our faces. He glanced at the phone in his hand, knowing that the story was already out. There was no way to sweep this under the rug. As word spread about Jamal's wrongful arrest, it reached his closest colleagues. Denise Carter, a fellow civil rights attorney and one of Jamal's closest friends, was in the middle of a meeting when her phone buzzed with a notification. At first, she ignored it, focused on her client's case, but the buzzing continued, and eventually, curiosity got the best of her. She glanced down at her screen, and what she saw stopped her cold. The message was from another lawyer at the firm. Did you see the news? They've arrested Jamal. Dennis's heart skipped a beat. Her mind raced as she quickly searched for more details. It didn't take long to find them. Videos of the arrest were already circulating online. She watched in stunned silence as footage of Jamal, handcuffed and being led to a police car, played on her phone. Her jaw tightened as she watched her friend, someone who had spent his life fighting for justice, treated like a criminal. Without wasting another moment, Denise gathered her things and rushed out of the meeting. Her thoughts raced as she headed to the precinct where Jamal was being held. She couldn't believe this was happening. Jamal had always been careful, always aware of how to navigate situations like this. But no amount of caution had protected him from the prejudice and ignorance that still plagued the system. Denise's anger simmered beneath the surface, but she knew she had to keep a cool head. There was work to be done. As she drove to the station, Denise called her firm, instructing them to prepare for a potential legal storm. They needed to be ready to file motions, contact the media, and ensure that Jamal's rights were protected. This wasn't just a personal issue. This was a matter of public importance. Jamal's wrongful arrest had the potential to expose the deep-seated biases in the police department, and Denise was determined to make sure it did. Back at the police station, the officers who had arrested Jamal were beginning to realize the full gravity of their mistake. The sergeant, still holding the phone with Jamal's profile displayed on the screen, shook his head in disbelief. 
Do you have any idea who this man is? He asked, his voice rising with frustration. The officers shifted uncomfortably, avoiding eye contact. They had made a critical error, and now they were scrambling to figure out how to fix it. The sergeant didn't wait for an answer. This is Jamal West, he continued, his voice tinged with disbelief. One of the most prominent civil rights attorneys in the country. The man has taken on high-profile cases, argued in federal courts, and now you've arrested him. For what? His question hung in the air, unanswered. The officers exchanged uneasy glances, but none of them dared to speak. There was no justification for what they had done, and they knew it. The sergeant's anger simmered beneath the surface, but he was also panicked. This was more than just a public relations nightmare. This was a potential legal disaster. Jamal wasn't just any attorney. He was someone who had spent his career dismantling cases of police misconduct and racial profiling. And now, they had handed him the perfect case on a silver platter. The sergeant knew they were in trouble, and it was only a matter of time before the entire department felt the fallout. Get him out of that holding cell, the sergeant ordered, his voice sharp. We need to clean this up now. The officers nodded, moving quickly to follow his instructions. But as they headed toward the holding area to release Jamal, they knew it was too late to undo the damage. The truth was already out there, and soon everyone would know what had happened. The sergeant's question, do you know who he is? Echoed in their minds, a reminder of their colossal mistake. As the officers approached the holding cell, their anxiety was palpable. Jamal had been sitting quietly, his mind focused on the next steps, when the door swung open. The two officers from earlier stepped inside, their expressions no longer cold and indifferent. Now, they were filled with unease. One of them cleared his throat awkwardly before speaking. Mr. West, he began, his voice tense, we're going to release you. There's been a misunderstanding. Jamal raised an eyebrow but said nothing. He could see the panic in their eyes, the realization that they had made a grave error. Slowly he stood up, his tall frame towering over the officers as they fumbled with the key to remove his handcuffs. The clinking sound of the metal falling away was the only noise in the room. Jamal rubbed his wrists, which were sore from the tight cuffs, and locked eyes with the officers. He didn't need to say anything. Their mistake was already painfully clear. One of the officers, the younger of the two, spoke again, this time with a hint of desperation in his voice. Look, we didn't know who you were. If we had, this wouldn't have happened. Jamal's gaze remained steady, his face calm but his eyes sharp. Who I am shouldn't matter, he replied, his voice steady but filled with quiet anger. You shouldn't have arrested me in the first place. The fact that it matters now just shows what's wrong with this entire system. The officers shifted uncomfortably, unsure of how to respond. They were no longer in control of the situation, and they knew it. Jamal had the upper hand, and the consequences of their actions were starting to close in on them. As Jamal stepped out of the cell, the weight of their panic settled heavily in the room. This was far from over. The officers knew that their mistake would follow them, casting a long shadow over their careers and the department as a whole. Jamal stepped out of the holding area with a calm, controlled demeanor, but inside the weight of the moment hung heavy. The officers, who had been so confident in their actions, were now visibly shaken, whispering among themselves as they watched him leave. In their eyes, Jamal was no longer just a suspect. He had become a ticking time bomb that could destroy their careers and expose the deep flaws within the system they operated. As Jamal reached the front of the precinct, the doors swung open, revealing a scene he hadn't expected. Reporters and cameramen had gathered outside, their cameras pointed at the station's entrance, waiting for a glimpse of the man who had become the center of a rapidly escalating scandal. The flash of lights and the murmur of questions hit him like a wave. His true identity had been revealed, and the world wanted answers. But it wasn't just the media waiting for him. Denise, his colleague, stood near the entrance, her arms crossed a look of quiet fury on her face. She had arrived just in time to see Jamal walk out, free but not unscathed. She rushed toward him, the weight of everything that had happened etched in her expression. Are you okay? She asked, her voice steady but filled with concern. Jamal nodded, but the look in his eyes told her that this was far from over. 
As they walked past the reporters, Jamal felt a mixture of relief and exhaustion. He hadn't even begun to process the depth of what had just happened, but he knew that the world outside would soon be dissecting every moment. His identity, now fully exposed, wasn't just that of a civil rights attorney. It was a man who had lived through the very injustice he fought against. And now, everyone would know his name for more than just his courtroom victories. The world now knew Jamal West as more than a civil rights attorney. He was a man who had been wronged by the very system he had dedicated his life to improving. News outlets quickly picked up the story, framing it as both a tragic irony and a damning indictment of systemic racism. Jamal had spent years defending people who had experienced similar injustices, but now his own wrongful arrest had thrust him into the spotlight in a way he hadn't expected. As the news spread, more details about Jamal's career began to emerge. His high-profile cases were revisited by the media, painting him as a modern-day crusader for justice. Jamal had represented victims of police brutality, fought against discriminatory laws, and worked tirelessly to hold powerful institutions accountable. His legal victories were numerous, but now his personal story had become just as important as the cases he had fought. Jamal's name was on every news station, in every article, and across social media. People who had never heard of him before were now championing his cause, demanding accountability from the police department that had wrongfully arrested him. But for Jamal, this wasn't about fame. It was about justice. He had spent his life advocating for others, and now he was faced with a decision. How would he use this platform to create lasting change? Denise, always at his side, reminded him of the gravity of the situation. This isn't just about you, Jamal, she said one evening as they prepared to address the media. This is about every black man who's ever been in your shoes. They're looking to you now, and you have a chance to make this more than just a news story. Jamal nodded, knowing that his personal experience had become a symbol for something much larger than himself. As the legal world began to process the full impact of Jamal's wrongful arrest, reactions were swift and intense. Lawyers, judges, and public officials across the country were shocked by the news. Many of Jamal's colleagues who had worked with him on civil rights cases for years were outraged by what had happened. They knew the system was flawed, but seeing one of their own subjected to such an injustice brought the issue into sharp focus. Legal organizations issued statements condemning the actions of the police officers involved in Jamal's arrest, calling for immediate investigations and reforms. The American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, publicly supported Jamal, demanding that the department be held accountable for racial profiling. Prominent law firms that had previously worked with Jamal reached out, offering their resources and support to ensure that justice would be served. But the backlash wasn't limited to Jamal's allies. Within law enforcement circles, there were whispers of frustration and defensiveness. Some officers within the department saw Jamal's wrongful arrest as an isolated incident refusing to acknowledge the systemic issues that had led to the mistake. Others, however, recognized the growing public pressure and feared that this could lead to sweeping reforms they weren't ready for. Jamal, meanwhile, remained focused. He had spent his entire career navigating the legal system, and he knew that real change wouldn't come from outrage alone. It required action. As he watched the legal world react to his story, he began to strategize thinking of how he could turn this moment into something meaningful. The legal community was behind him, and he knew that with the right approach, this could be the catalyst for real reform. The media storm surrounding Jamal's wrongful arrest grew larger by the day. National news networks picked up the story, broadcasting segments that dissected every moment of the encounter, from the initial arrest to Jamal's release. Pundits and commentators debated the implications with many pointing out the irony of Jamal's situation. A man who had spent his life fighting for justice was now a victim of the very system he had tried to improve. Jamal found himself fielding requests for interviews from major networks, each eager to hear his perspective on what had happened. His inbox was flooded with messages from journalists, producers, and documentary filmmakers who wanted to turn his story into a larger commentary on racial profiling and police misconduct. It was overwhelming, but Jamal knew that the media attention was a double-edged sword. 
While the spotlight could amplify his message, it also meant that his every word would be scrutinized. He had to be careful, measured in his responses, knowing that one wrong statement could be twisted and used against him. Denise helped him navigate the media frenzy, acting as both a confidant and a strategist. Together, they crafted statements that spoke to the larger issues at hand while avoiding the pitfalls of sensationalism. As Jamal prepared for his first live television interview, he took a deep breath. The cameras were set, the lights bright, and the world was watching. He knew that this moment was more than just about his personal experience. It was about exposing a system that had failed so many before him. As the countdown to the broadcast began, Jamal felt a sense of calm wash over him. He was ready to speak his truth, and this time the world was listening. While traditional media amplified Jamal's story, it was social media that turned it into a global movement. Within hours of the initial arrest footage going viral, hashtags demanding justice for Jamal flooded platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Activists, celebrities, and influencers rallied around his story, sharing posts that called for systemic change and accountability. The incident quickly became a symbol of the broader fight against racial injustice. Posts and videos detailing Jamal's career as a civil rights attorney were shared millions of times, transforming him from a respected lawyer into a national icon. His arrest became not just a news story, but a call to action for people all over the world. Memes, infographics, and emotional videos about the injustice he faced spread like wildfire, pushing the conversation beyond the legal world and into everyday households. Jamal, who had always been a private person, found himself at the center of a social media whirlwind. Messages of support poured in from all corners of the world, people sharing their own stories of wrongful treatment by the police, families of victims of police brutality reaching out to thank him for his work. The sheer volume of responses was overwhelming, but it also gave Jamal a sense of purpose. This was no longer just about him. It was about the collective voices demanding change. Denise, ever the strategist, saw the power in this moment. We need to use this momentum, Jamal, she said one evening, as they scrolled through the endless stream of online content. People are listening and they want leadership. You have a chance to take this beyond just one incident and turn it into a movement. Jamal nodded. He knew she was right. The power of social media had brought him to the world's attention, and now it was up to him to decide how to harness it. In the days following his release, Jamal kept a low profile, despite the media frenzy. While the world was eager for him to speak out, Jamal took the time to process what had happened. He had spent years advocating for justice, but now the weight of being a public figure in this fight felt different. His silence wasn't out of fear, it was strategic. He knew that in moments like this, words mattered more than ever. During his time away from the spotlight, Jamal reflected on the countless individuals he had represented, people whose stories were never told, whose names were never remembered by the public. His experience, as painful as it was, had brought attention to a larger issue. But Jamal knew that for every person like him who made headlines, there were thousands who didn't. He owed it to them to make this moment count. He met with his legal team, including Denise, and together they mapped out a plan. Jamal wanted to make sure that his personal experience didn't overshadow the systemic issues that needed to be addressed. It wasn't enough to focus on his wrongful arrest. There needed to be real accountability, not just for the officers involved, but for the system that allowed this to happen in the first place. His silence was his strength a way to ensure that when he did speak, his words would carry the weight they deserved. Jamal's quiet resolve only fueled the public's anticipation. Reporters speculated about his next move, activists waited for his leadership, and the legal community prepared for what would come next. But Jamal wasn't in a rush. He understood that true change didn't happen overnight. When he finally did speak, it would be not just as a victim, but as a leader ready to challenge the system on behalf of everyone who had been wronged. Meanwhile, the police department couldn't ignore the growing pressure. The viral nature of Jamal's arrest, combined with the public outcry, forced them to launch an internal investigation. The officers involved in the arrest were placed on administrative leave, 
and an outside agency was brought in to review the department's practices. It was clear that the department was in damage control mode, but for many these actions felt too little, too late. The officers who had arrested Jamal found themselves under intense scrutiny. Their actions were dissected in the media, their histories examined for any previous incidents of misconduct. For the first time, they were experiencing the consequences of a system they had once benefited from. Inside the department, tensions ran high. Some officers defended their colleagues, insisting that the arrest was an unfortunate mistake, while others recognized that this incident was a symptom of a much larger problem. The investigation also uncovered disturbing patterns within the department. Reports of racial profiling, excessive use of force, and discriminatory practices surfaced painting a picture of a deeply flawed system. The more the investigation revealed, the more the public demanded accountability. It wasn't just about Jamal anymore. It was about addressing a culture of impunity that had been allowed to fester for years. As the investigation progressed, it became clear that this wasn't going to be a simple case of a few bad actors. The department itself was implicated, and calls for leadership resignations grew louder. For Jamal, this was exactly what he had hoped for. His wrongful arrest had sparked a conversation that was long overdue, and now the truth was coming to light. But he knew that an investigation alone wasn't enough. Real change required systemic reform. As the investigation continued, the public's outrage intensified. Protests erupted in the city, with demonstrators calling for justice not just for Jamal, but for every black person who had been wrongfully targeted by the police. The streets filled with signs demanding accountability and chants of no justice, no peace echoed through the air. What had begun as a single arrest had ignited a movement. Jamal watched from afar, moved by the outpouring of support, but also deeply aware of the weight of the moment. He had spent his career fighting for justice in the courtroom, but now justice was being demanded in the streets. People who had never protested before were joining the marches, fueled by a sense of collective anger and hope. The energy was palpable, and it wasn't just happening in his city. Protests were springing up across the country. Local politicians, sensing the public mood, began to speak out as well. Some called for police reform, others pushed for stronger oversight of law enforcement. The mayor, under intense pressure, promised swift action to address the findings of the investigation. But for many, his words rang hollow. The public didn't want promises. They wanted results. And they were prepared to keep protesting until real changes were made. For Jamal, watching the protest was both inspiring and overwhelming. He had always believed in the power of the people. But seeing it unfold in real time gave him a new sense of responsibility. This wasn't just about his fight anymore. It was about all the people who had been let down by the system. He knew that when he finally stepped back into the public eye, he would need to be a voice for all of them, not just for himself. In the quiet moments away from the chaos, Jamal found himself reflecting deeply on how far he had come. He thought back to his early days as a young lawyer, full of passion, but still learning how to navigate a world that wasn't always fair. He had chosen to become a civil rights attorney because he believed in justice, in the idea that the law could be a tool for change. But now, as he sat at the center of a national firestorm, he was forced to reckon with the fact that even he wasn't immune to the injustices he had spent his life fighting. Jamal remembered the first time he had represented a client who had been wrongfully arrested. The anger, the frustration, the humiliation his client had felt. It was all so real to him now. In some ways, his experience had given him a deeper understanding of what his clients had gone through but it had also left him with a sense of profound disillusionment. How could a system so broken ever be fixed? Despite the challenges, Jamal refused to give in to despair. He had always believed that change was possible, even if it was slow and painful. He thought of the people who had inspired him along the way, mentors, colleagues, clients who had never given up, even in the face of overwhelming odds. They had fought for justice, and now it was his turn to lead by example. He had been given a platform, and he intended to use it to bring about real change. In those reflective moments, Jamal made a promise to himself. He wouldn't let this incident define him as a victim. Instead, he would use it as a catalyst for something greater. He would continue to fight, 
not just for himself, but for every person who had been silenced, mistreated, or ignored by the system. This was his calling, and now more than ever, he was ready to answer it. With the investigation in full swing and public support growing, Jamal knew it was time to take the fight for justice to the next level. The initial shock of his wrongful arrest had passed, and now it was time to strategize. Alongside Denise and a team of legal experts, Jamal began to plan the next steps. This wasn't just about clearing his name. It was about exposing the systemic flaws in law enforcement that allowed racial profiling and wrongful arrests to occur unchecked. Jamal's first move was to file a civil rights lawsuit against the police department. The lawsuit was not only aimed at the officers who had arrested him, but also at the department as a whole, alleging a pattern of discriminatory practices. By doing this, Jamal hoped to force the department into accountability, not just for his arrest, but for the countless other individuals who had suffered similar injustices. He knew that change would only come if the legal system demanded it. The lawsuit was a bold move, and Jamal knew it would face resistance from the department and its legal team. But he also knew that he had the public on his side. The media continued to cover his story extensively, and every new development was met with renewed outrage from the public. Jamal had become a symbol of the fight against systemic racism, and people across the country were rallying behind him, demanding justice not just for Jamal, but for all victims of police misconduct. As the lawsuit gained momentum, Jamal and Denise began working with advocacy groups, community leaders, and politicians to push for broader reforms. They advocated for changes in police training, increased oversight, and the implementation of policies that would prevent racial profiling and hold officers accountable for their actions. Jamal's fight for justice had evolved into something much bigger than his personal experience. It had become a movement for change. As Jamal's lawsuit against the police department unfolded, the media attention around the case intensified, news outlets followed every development, and Jamal became a fixture on television, radio, and online platforms. Interviews with him and Denise appeared regularly, where they spoke about not only the specifics of the case, but the broader issues of racial injustice and police accountability. Jamal's calm, composed demeanor in the face of such adversity, resonated deeply with viewers. But with the growing media presence came its own set of challenges. While many praised Jamal for his bravery and resilience, there were also detractors. Some commentators attempted to paint him as opportunistic, accusing him of using the arrest to advance his career or agenda. Others questioned the validity of his claims, suggesting that the officers had acted within reason. The noise from both sides made the public conversation more intense, but it only fueled Jamal's resolve. Denise became a key figure in managing the media storm. She fielded interviews, organized press conferences, and made sure that Jamal's message remained clear and focused. Together, they worked tirelessly to ensure that the heart of the issue, systemic injustice, remained at the forefront of the conversation. The media's fixation on the drama of the case was unavoidable, but Jamal and Denise were determined not to let the true message be overshadowed by sensationalism. Throughout it all, Jamal remained centered on his mission. The media attention was a tool, a way to amplify his voice and the voices of those who had been silenced for too long. He knew that change wouldn't come overnight, but by keeping the pressure on through the media, he could ensure that the issues he was fighting for wouldn't fade from the public consciousness. The media storm was swirling but Jamal was ready to weather it. As Jamal's case gained national attention and the lawsuit against the police department progressed, the officers who had arrested him found themselves in an increasingly precarious position. What had initially seemed like a routine arrest had now turned into a potential career-ending scandal. The public outcry, the media scrutiny, and the internal investigation all pointed to one thing. Their actions had been deeply flawed, and now, they were facing the consequences. The officers' panic grew as more details of the arrest were made public. They had expected that the department would protect them, that their actions would be defended as part of their duty. But as the investigation revealed deeper issues within the department, it became clear that the higher-ups were looking for someone to blame. The officers feared they would become scapegoats in a larger attempt to placate the public, 
and avoid further backlash. In a desperate attempt to salvage their reputations, the officers began working with their legal teams, crafting a narrative that painted the arrest as a misunderstanding rather than a deliberate act of racial profiling. They claimed that Jamal's behavior had been suspicious, that they were simply following protocol, and that they had no idea who he was. But the public wasn't buying it. The footage of the arrest told a different story, one of arrogance and prejudice. As the pressure mounted, the officers' desperation became more apparent. Their legal teams leaked statements to the press, trying to garner sympathy by claiming that the officers were being unfairly targeted. But every move they made seemed to backfire, further cementing the public's belief that they had acted out of bias. The officers were learning the hard way that their actions had consequences, and no amount of excuses could undo the damage they had caused. The officers who had wrongfully arrested Jamal soon found themselves at the center of multiple legal battles. Jamal's lawsuit against the department was only the beginning. Civil rights organizations filed additional complaints, and some of Jamal's supporters even called for criminal charges to be brought against the officers for misconduct. The weight of their actions was bearing down on them, and it was clear that this was not a fight they could easily win. The legal consequences weren't limited to the officers themselves. The entire police department was under scrutiny, with investigators uncovering years of complaints and allegations of racial profiling that had gone unaddressed. As more information came to light, it became clear that Jamal's arrest was part of a much larger problem within the department. Calls for reform grew louder and the public demanded accountability, not just from the officers, but from the leadership that had allowed this culture to persist. Jamal's legal team, led by Denise, was relentless in their pursuit of justice. They filed motion after motion, demanding transparency from the department and pushing for reforms that would prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. The legal battles were long and grueling, but Jamal remained focused. This wasn't just about winning a lawsuit. It was about creating lasting change. As the legal battles played out in court, Jamal became more than just a plaintiff. He was a symbol of the fight for justice, a reminder that no one, not even a prominent attorney, was immune to the biases and flaws in the system. The legal consequences for the officers and the department were severe, but they were also necessary. Jamal knew that true justice would only come when the system itself was reformed, and he was determined to see it through. As the lawsuits progressed and the public continued to rally behind him, Jamal found himself at a crossroads. He had always been a private person, someone who preferred to work behind the scenes, using his legal skills to help others without drawing too much attention to himself. But now, he was a public figure, and people were looking to him for leadership. The media, the activists, the people on the streets, they all saw Jamal as a voice for change. Jamal had to decide how he wanted to move forward. Did he want to continue his work as a civil rights attorney, quietly advocating for justice in the courtroom? Or did he want to step into a more public role, using his platform to push for broader reforms? It was a decision that weighed heavily on him. He knew that with the spotlight came pressure, and with pressure came responsibility. But he also knew that this moment was bigger than him. After much reflection, Jamal made his decision. He would continue his work as a lawyer, but he wouldn't shy away from the public eye. He had been given a platform, and he intended to use it. He would speak out against injustice, advocate for policy changes, and work with organizations that were fighting for systemic reform. Jamal knew that his experience could help bring about the change he had always fought for, and he was ready to embrace that role. Jamal's decision wasn't just about him. It was about the people who had supported him the people who had looked to him for leadership, and the people who were still suffering under the weight of an unjust system. He was ready to take on that responsibility, knowing that the fight for justice was far from over. This was his path now, and he was determined to walk it with purpose and conviction. With his decision made, Jamal embarked on a new chapter in his life. He continued to fight in the courtroom, representing clients who had been wronged by the system, but he also stepped into a more public role, becoming a vocal advocate for police reform and racial justice. His story had inspired millions, and now Jamal was using that inspiration to push for real, lasting change. He worked closely with advocacy groups, 
helping to draft legislation that would increase accountability for law enforcement and protect the rights of marginalized communities. Jamal's work went beyond just winning cases. He was focused on changing the very systems that had failed so many for so long. It was a long and difficult journey, but Jamal was no stranger to perseverance. He knew that change wouldn't come overnight, but he was committed to the fight. The public continued to rally behind him, and Jamal's name became synonymous with the fight for justice. He appeared at rallies, gave speeches, and met with lawmakers, always focused on the larger goal. For Jamal, this wasn't about personal fame or recognition. It was about ensuring that the injustices he had faced would not be repeated. His wrongful arrest had been the catalyst, but the movement that had grown from it was far bigger than any one person. As Jamal stood at the forefront of the fight for justice, he reflected on how far he had come. His journey had been marked by pain, struggle, and perseverance, but it had also been filled with hope. He had turned a moment of injustice into an opportunity for change, and now he was leading the charge toward a better future. This was the beginning of a new chapter, not just for Jamal, but for everyone who believed in the fight for a fairer, more just world.